All of the Fretboard Journal podcasts are brought to you by a few presenting sponsors. First up is Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars and Strings remain the choice for musicians around the world for their unrivaled quality, craftsmanship, and tone. Then we have Carter Vintage Guitars over in Nashville, where guitar lovers go for a good time. And we have a brand new presenting sponsor, Calton Cases. Your custom instrument deserves a custom case. Thank you to all of our presenting sponsors. Hey everyone, welcome to the Fretboard Journal Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Verlindi, and as always, that is John Rauhaus playing in the background, and I am realizing, because I don't know why I decided to look it up, our very first podcast, our very first Fretboard Journal Podcast, took place nearly 12 years ago in April of 2009. And John Rauhaus was on that show. And I don't encourage anyone to go try to track it down because it did not sound good. I think we've upped our production game and I've, I've definitely upped my interview game since that uh, first podcast aired. Maybe for the 12th anniversary, I'll just get John back on this podcast and we can hear him in high fidelity and actually know sort of what we are doing. I hope everybody out there is doing well. The Fretboard Journal's 47th issue is mailing to everybody right now, so if you need to get your copy, if you want to support what we do, now is a great time to subscribe. You can go to fretboardjournal.com. We have the digital edition, which is just $30 for four issues, no matter where in the world you are. And then, of course, we have the keepsake print edition, which is basically a coffee table book that mails to your house four times a year. James Taylor is on the cover of that issue. He just won a Grammy, and we talked to him all about his new record, American Standard, as well as talk to John Pizzarelli, as well as talk to Jim Olson. And then we ended up talking to Paul Stanley of Kiss, who just got a guitar from Jim Olson. So uh, it's this weird ecosystem of guitarists and luthiers and music lovers. And somehow it all becomes this 128-page package of storytelling and guitars, guitar porn, some people call it. We also have John Monteleone and Ben Harper in that issue. Bahamas, one of my favorite acts. Uh, David Wren, which I will get to in one second. And a lot more. So please support us if this sounds at all interesting to you. There's no other guitar magazine like this anywhere. So the reason I was looking up when we started this podcast is because we've expanded our podcast offerings a ton this year. We just put up the very first episode of Diddy Wad Diddy, a brand new blues podcast hosted by John Tavius Willis, who was actually on this podcast a while ago. John Tavius is going to be interviewing some of his blues heroes. The very first episode is up now with Taj Mahal. I encourage any blues fans or anybody out there who just wants to hear great storytelling to check out that episode. We've, of course, got the Truth About Vintage Amps podcast, which I co-host, We've got the Truth About Recording and Mixing podcast. We've got all of these amazing offerings, Luthier on Luthier. I'm not going to name them all. I'll forget one. Uh, But during the pandemic of 2020, I had an idea for one more podcast, a podcast that was going to be totally personal, really have no business sensibility behind it, and was going to be away from the world of music and guitars because I interview guitar people all the time, literally every week for this podcast and for the magazine. And I want to interview some of the folks who build stuff that has nothing to do with guitars. So I decided to start this podcast called Sweep the Floor, where I was going to interview some of my favorite makers who maybe have nothing to do with the world of music, people who build boots and knives and canoes and God knows what else, car designers, you name it. I follow all these people on Instagram I sort of know their story, no Instagram pun intended, but I didn't really know how they got from they were a kid to now they're the top of their craft doing amazing work and having tens of thousands of followers. So I decided to start cold calling them, and I've done a handful of these. They've been amazing. Sweep the Floor launched a couple of weeks ago, and just to keep everybody on their toes and make things super bizarre. My very first interview was the token guitar maker of the series, Linda Manzer. Linda Manzer happens to also be featured in the Fretboard Journal 47 in a amazing story David Wren penned for us about the early days of Laravé guitars. He's got these amazing photos where 
Linda Manzer looks like Joni Mitchell from back in the day. And uh, it just was such a beautiful, synchronous little thing that happened. And so uh, what you are hearing today on the Fretboard Journal podcast is basically a bonus episode. I am letting you tune in to the first episode of Sweep the Floor. It is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all those places. So if you think you might be interested in taking a journey with me, and hearing about some people from all different sorts of walks of life every two weeks who make exceptionally cool stuff with their two hands. Maybe you'll subscribe. I hope you will. If you're sick of my voice and you feel like the Fretboard Journal podcast is more than enough, you don't need to. But I did want to share the one guitar interview that I will do for that show because Lint is amazing. And uh, Pat Metheny just put out a beautiful new record. The very last track, Arvo Pert, played on a Linda Manzer Picasso guitar, 42 strings. Uh, You must go check that out. Before we get to this broadcast of the first episode of Sweep the Floor, let me just tell you that the Fretboard Journal podcast has some sponsors, and I want to thank them. First up is Retrofret Vintage Guitars. I mean, where to begin? They get so many cool guitars every single week. Right now... They have probably the most blinged out arch top you will ever see, a 1933 Bacon and Day Nay Plus Ultra Troubadour 3R. Just go put your sunglasses on, open up your browser, go look at that guitar, read up on it. Maybe somebody out there needs that guitar. It is an amazing thing. They also have much more normal looking guitars, a Martin, 1953 Martin 00018. I saw a Bronson Rickenbacker lap steel that looked incredibly cool. They've got all sorts of amazing stuff. Go to retrofret.com. Tell them the Fretboard Journal sent you. Our friends over at Folkway Music up in Canada, like Linda Manzer, also have some amazing guitars, a whole batch of new Martins and Taylors. Mark has one of the great acoustic guitar stores in all of Canada, and I don't think this is going to last very long, but he happens to have a 1937 16-inch arch top Gibson L30 I say arch top with an emphasis because the back is flat because it was one of those cheaper guitars back in the day, but now is one of those really cool survivor guitars. Our last sponsor is our friends over at Mono Cases. You can go to monocreators.com to see their entire lineup of gig bags, studio monitor stands, pedal boards, pedal board bags. Everybody who's been getting the new issue of the Fretboard Journal has been commenting on how great it is that Mono sponsors our little cardboard mailers so your issues don't get banged up. So thank you to Mono. Support them. Thank them for supporting our little podcast and our magazine and everything else that we do. Those are the big updates that I have for you. I will just let you know we got another podcast interview coming your way this week uh, beyond this Linda Manzer one. And I can't thank you guys all for all the support. Obviously, if uh, you have any friends who you think should check the show out, please share it with them. Please keep leaving us reviews over on Apple Podcasts. This little 12-year podcast journey has been quite an adventure for us. I thought I was just putting out a print magazine. Who knew? But uh, it's been quite fun, and I love all the feedback you guys keep sending me at podcast at fretboardjournal.com. So without further ado, here is my interview for the first episode of the Sweep the Floor podcast with Linda Manzer, acclaimed guitar maker from Canada. I hope you enjoy it. When did the guitar bug start for you and and I, you know, I know you've told the story of working alongside Larve a million times, but tell it again. Tell me the story. Okay. Well, actually, the guitar bug bit me when I was um, in grade five and six, and I saw the Beatles. So it's kind of their fault. Um, and I was in little bands with my my little girlfriends, and we would be the mop tops or you know copies of the Beatles. So I, I kind of started, and then I became a folk singer as a, a teenager. Uh, not very good, but I loved thrashing around on the guitar as a teenager. And then I went to art colleges, and I kept ending up in the woodworking shop. And I realized at some point that what I really wanted to do was make musical instruments because it kind of combined everything I was interested in, which was music and art and science in a way. Um, and it's, it really intrigued me. So I, I went about looking for somebody to apprentice with. And this was in 1974. 
And at that point, there was no internet, and there was it was very hard to communicate with people other than through the, the, the mail. And I've heard about a guy in Toronto who um, who was making guitars. His name was Jean-Claude Larrave, but I was told I would never get an apprenticeship with him because he had a waiting list as long as his arm. Um, but undaunted, I, I basically bugged him. I found him. I bugged him until he hired me. Um, and he, he didn't originally want to hire me because I was a girl, quote unquote, and um, I talked him into it. Um, <laughs> And um, and then I studied with him. I worked with him with uh, an amazing crew of people. He had this way of attracting not only the, the best craftsmen, because they're all men, uh, but also incredibly wonderful people who were had really good hearts and were incredibly creative. And that sort of became my, my guitar-making family to start with, uh, which would include David Wren and Grit Laskin and George Gray and Tony Duggan-Smith. And uh, I didn't study with, I didn't actually work with Sergei de Young, but he was there and Jean-Claude Larrave. And there are a few others, but uh, those people have ended up being my friends throughout my entire career. And we have watched each other's back and supported each other and helped each other uh, grow into much better guitar makers. So, and then uh, after Larrave, I studied also in Long Island with James D'Aquisto, who was an archtop guitar builder. And he uh, came from the lineage of um, uh, John D'Angelico. And um, I was able to study in, John, in, in Jimmy's shop, James DeQuisto's shop in Long Island for the winter of 83, 84. And that's where I got my start building archtop guitars, jazz guitars. All right. I have a million questions. What <laughs> was it about, because with the lens of like, current day looking at people working for a guitar shop it is very rare for people to then go splinter off and become acclaimed in their own right as guitar makers was that Larave shop vibe more like a co-op or was it just that Jean Larave was so open with information and knowledge that anyone could go take the torch and run with it well we all worked with him um and but it was small there was only I think six of us at one point cranking out six guitars a week. So each one, we were all involved in all parts of the guitar making, but they were all Larave's guitars. They weren't our own guitars. And after you'd been there for a while, you would kind of, you know, gather your courage and ask him if you could make your own guitar. But, you know, you knew that really the shop was his shop. It was his rules and his, his methods. And, well, we would, in our spare time, a few of us would make guitars, um, but at, at a certain point, each person finished, you know, their time there was done. You kind of outgrew being an apprentice and it was time to open up your, you know, put a shingle on your own shop. So one by one, we all left um, and uh, kept in touch with each other because, you know, it was kind of lonely. Uh, there was, as I said, there was no internet. So if you wanted to know where to get a supply, you actually had to pick up the phone and call you know, somebody like David Wren and Grit Laskin and, and, and who in essence were your competitors, but also they were your support system. So we became very close. Um, you know, I, I, we wanted each other to succeed. So it, it was a real lovely family sort of situation, but we were all completely separate, had our own shops. And, and eventually we only, we all had our own styles. For instance, uh, I had a particular type of music I was really interested in, so I would seek out that type of player who I wanted to make a guitar for. So over time, when we started, we were all competing with each other for the same customers. But over time, as my style developed and Grit Laskin's style developed and David Wren's style developed, we all had our own voices in our own guitars, which drew our particular types of clients so we didn't really, it didn't really overlap in the end. So it worked out really beautifully. You, you know, it's just, it was, it's quite a, it's quite a lovely profession to be in, I have yeah. to say. And I can't just gloss over the Diakisto year. Did you, okay. uh, did you work solo before that and then decide you needed to go there? Or was that straight out of Larave? I had been working on my own at that point. Um, and in fact, I was in my shop uh, above a pool hall, which I shared with a lute maker called Michael Schreiner, 
um, and uh, I got a phone call from Jimmy DeQuisto, and he was actually calling me because he'd read an article in, I think it was Fretz magazine, and um, he'd read it wrong. He'd, he'd, somebody had quoted, uh, he, he misunderstood a quote where, uh, and he was calling me to actually give me shit um, about the quote. And it wasn't my quote, it was somebody else's. And th- it was that uh, they would scrap guitars, they would scrape guitars if they had flaws. And he was correcting me to tell me they would scrape guitars to tune them, but he'd read the word wrong. It was they would scrap the guitars if they had flaws. And that was how he called me. And um, we ended up talking and uh, sort of becoming friends over that that phone call. And he invited me to come down and visit him in Long Island, which I did within a few months. And I asked him if I could study with him. And we worked out an arrangement uh, where I paid him to do that. And I was there for the course of one, I would say one season of guitar making, 83, 84. So I would go down there. And I'd stay with him for 10 days and uh, work in his shop side by side, making my guitar and watch, you know, how he did. It was very different from Larvae. It was really interesting. I want to hear more about this. What did you learn? Well, I always think of it in terms with Larvae. I learned technically how to build a a really well-built guitar and started to, you know, add all the nuances in it. What I learned from Jimmy was how to put heart and soul into a guitar because he was very intuitive. He's very um, trusting his gut. And um, he had a kind of a sense that was uncanny, where he could pick up a piece of wood, and just by rubbing it gently with his fingers, he could hear all the, the potential of all the sound in it in a way I had not experienced before. So basically my role with him, my job with him, was to watch him really carefully to see what he did because sometimes when he explained things, it didn't quite make sense. But if you watched what he did really carefully, you could get a sense of what he was doing. I mean, I, I kind of wish now, you know, decades later, I could have that same amount of time with him because I would have really different questions for him. But, you know, it was a great, I mean, what an unbelievably great start to learn how to make that type of guitar. And, and were you just like living with him for those 10 days at a time? Yeah, I would stay in um, in the house in uh, in the kids' room, and we'd work all day. And then he would cook uh, spaghetti, and uh, he would uh, he would read. Uh, he was quite interested in Michelangelo, so he would often wax eloquently about <laughs> the works and the life of Michelangelo. He was very very proud of his Italian heritage. Was this it was intimidating real- for you, or was this just fun? Oh. Yeah, I was a little kid. I mean, yeah, it was. It was, um, yeah, especially because once I understood sort of who he was when I went there, but once people started coming into the shop and I started learning about the history, because I wasn't, to be honest, I wasn't that interested, that interested in arch top guitars before I went into his shop because my experience with arch top guitars was they always sounded kind of bad because they were always set up wrong or they were completely electric and they weren't acoustic. Um, But when I went in there, I saw that in the hands of the right player, there was something magic about the arch top guitar, which I had never experienced before. And it was quite an eye opener for me as a builder. I mean, I was quite established at that point as a flat top builder. And I was actually at that time working with Pat Matheny. I was on about the fifth instrument with Pat. So I had, it was a. It was just an amazing experience. I, I felt like I walked into a museum in some ways. His methods were quite. Um, I don't want to say primitive because that doesn't sound positive. They were um, simple and to the point. And and he never lost sight of the end goal, which was to make a tool for the musician that sounded and felt amazing. And that was his goal. And he was really good at it really good at it did he have to worry or did he ever talk to you about just the nuts and bolts of the business of making guitars and how to make a living or was he so established that he could do what he wanted he was in a transition period i think with his career when i was there he was uh kind of the top you know he was the top dog in the arch top building world at that point and he was 
a lot a lot of people were seeking out his guitars so he he had a lot of orders for the angelical style guitars but he really wanted to do his own style he had a lot of ideas but he was kind of trapped building guitars that that he had already built and designed and John D'Angelico had built and um when I was there he was telling me how lucky I was that I wasn't um I didn't have that restriction in my career that he had um and business wise I'm I think he could have been a little more together from my observation um I think if somebody came along who wanted a new guitar um he would sort of put them ahead of the old guitars the old style guitars that he was building um so I you know I I I learned from that actually because I you know if you make a commitment to somebody professionally you kind of need to stick with it and I think he could have been a little better at at that part of it. Uh, I don't want to say anything, you know, negative about him because everybody's got their own journey and everybody has to find out. He was in an unusual situation where he was basically, he was uh, becoming really popular and famous. And um, that's, that's always something hard to deal with the transition and how you deal with it is important. Yeah. Looking back, you know, this was 36 years ago, but, uh, Knowing what you know now, were any of his, the ways he put together a guitar, does it make you chuckle and you're thinking like, oh, why didn't he just do this? Or or did he have it nailed? Did he have it figured out? Um, he had a few uh, strong points and a few weak points. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it was always fun watching him bend guitar sides because it's hard to bend uh, maple, curly maple, because it wants to crack. And uh, he would get this really big grimace, you know, like this face as he was pushing the wood. Because there's a point where you you use heat and water to kind of soften the wood and make it more flexible. But then you have to use a certain amount of brute force to kind of force it. And and if you use too much force and not enough steam and heat, the guitar will crack. So um, I think that's one area I think I've gotten better at over the years. Um his, I think his, his strength was um, his overall design sense. He understood how all the parts went together. He understood the woods really well and um, how to carve them. And he understood setup and how important that was. He thought about guitars all the time. I mean, he was, you know, if, if you could see inside his brain, it would just be filled with guitar wallpaper everywhere. So, you know, he was just... He was guitars, guitars, guitars. Did he play? Yeah, he did a little. Um, I didn't see him play a lot, but, you know, he could, I think he played, yeah. But he knew, he knew the sound. Yeah, he and he was, you know, he, he was, he sort of took no prisoners with his customers in some ways, from what I've heard. He was, he was the boss. If you came in, you were buying his guitar his way, and he, um... Uh, the, you know, he he had a really strong opinion about how um, the, the person getting the guitar had to kind of meet the guitar halfway in a, in a way that to, to respect what he had done. And I think in a good way, he, he, he had a lot of confidence in what he did. And I think that really helped his work, actually, because I think it's important to have confidence when you're doing something like this. So, yeah, I think... He was he was amazing. I learned very different things from him than I learned from Larave, who and Larave, who I'm I'm still good friends with and in touch with. You know, just taught me a completely different style of thinking about guitars and building guitars. Yeah, when you when you left and you said, you know, obviously you had been building some pretty nice guitars. Pat Metheny was already playing them uh, in 1984 when you left Jimmy's place and went back home. Is there like a line in the sand there where your guitars became instantly different from whatever nebulous stuff you picked up from those from that apprenticeship? Um, no, I don't. I wouldn't say that. I, what I would say is that it when I left Aquisto, I didn't start building archtop guitars a lot until uh, it incrementally. I because I really needed to kind of digest everything that I'd learned 
and understand it because it's a difficult instrument to understand how it works, how the sound comes out of it, physically how it works. And I didn't want to just make something that looked like an archtop guitar. I wanted to really assimilate all the information sort of organically over time. So I waited years to start really building archtop guitars. And I'm actually, it is actually the primary type of guitar I'm making now. And I feel like I'm still learning, but I feel like I'm starting to get a handle on it decades later. (laughs) It's amazing. I I don't want to name names, but there's always young, you know, it's great that you see these young luthiers and they are diving into arch tops. But would your advice to anyone be build some flat tops first and wrap your head around that before you start curving stuff? Uh, I think whatever you do, um, I don't think it really matters. I think it matters that you apply passion um, and make mistakes because that's how you learn. Um, just dive in and make as many as you can. That's That would be my advice. Um, I mean, I, right now, as I'm sitting here talking to you, I've got three arch top guitars on my workbench that I'm carving the tops to. And I have to put my full attention to what I'm doing with them because every slice of the plane is taking off a little bit more wood. And I have to tap it and listen. And there's no rules. You just have to be in touch with your kind of you know inner computer or your inner intuition you have to really pay attention so you have to be really present you have to really dedicate yourself to it for sure and you know I I feel like I feel like I'm pretty good at what I do but I'm I can see tons of room for improvement um which is exciting because this this is like car making is a an area where there's so much room for expansion and learning and it's it never gets dull it's really hard to get bored when you're making a guitar yeah um what is your what is that carving process day i don't know if it goes on for multiple days what does it look like how do you prepare yourself and how do you come to battle <laughs> how do i come to battle um it actually it is like a little bit like being an athlete you have to really uh i i think about it the day before i think about it as uh, soon as i wake up i sometimes kind of map out my day mentally before I even get out of bed just so I kind of know where I'm going with it um I it takes days like I'm uh, I'm probably going to spend another week just working on these guitar tops here because I like to go away from them and come back but what I use is an arch top guitar is just basically a thick piece of wood it's about 20 inches by of 17 or 18 inches by an inch thick. And what you're doing is you're carving this curved surface into it that a bridge will sit on top of it and push down. And then you'll have some kind of sound hole on either side of the bridge. Um, So what you're doing is you're carving out basically a hill that this bridge is sitting on top of. And you have to, and it's moving air. when When you pluck the strings, the bridge makes the top move and that moves the air inside of the guitar. So what I do is I carve my style of doing it is I carve the inside of the top first. Um, and then I get that exactly where I want it. And then I carve the outside to match the inside, but I put in there's, I use light so I can see how thick the wood is. Like I put the the guitar top right up to a, a strong light bulb and I, I can see where it's thicker and thinner just from the amount of light coming through the wood. I tap the wood, I measure the wood and then I use a strong lamp on the surface of the guitar so I can see the hills and see where the arches are. I feel it, and your hand becomes desensitized after a while, so you have to sort of walk away and come back. So you're feeling the wood, and you're tapping it. It's very tactile. Wow. And often you can't listen to music because you have to listen to the guitars. Um, I like listening to music when I'm working, usually. But yeah, it's very, uh, you sort of have to be in the zone. So I don't like to be interrupted when I'm doing it. You said there's three of them. Do you try to do them more? Do you do one at a time or do you try to do them in batches? Um, I just happen to have three that are, that came up at the same time and they're really different, uh, from each other. So, um, they're, I'm kind of thinking about what each person asked me for and all three of them asked me for different things. So each guitar is going to be different. And I'm kind of comparing them to each other. Um, uh, I, it's, it depends, you know. I'm, I, 
I kind of work on whatever I feel like working on. So I've actually got quite a few guitars on the go right now, but the ones that I'm thinking about are the ones I work on. Got it. Um, you work with all sorts of artists, well-known, not well-known, obviously Julian Lodge, Pat Metheny, two of the bigger ones that, that at least I have contact with. Um, how did that relationship with Pat Metheny start? Well, I was a fan of his, his work um, from the first note I heard him play live with. He was in, he was, uh, in Joni Mitchell's backup band, and I heard him performing. I, didn't, I wasn't paying any attention to the band, really, until he played a solo. And it was kind of like my, the axis of my world shifted when he started playing. And I was instantly mesmerized by what he was doing. And I, I became a fan of his. So when he came to Toronto in 1981, I approached him and, and asked him, you know, I showed him a couple of my guitars backstage after a concert, not really expecting much. Um, and he ordered a guitar. And that was in 1981. And I made him kind of one guitar a year for years. And we're up to over 25 guitars, I think. Uh, and each one was different. Um, you know what? The thing was, I think we just connected as people. Uh, I didn't know. He, he was looking for somebody to make guitars that would bring to life sounds he was thinking of in his head. And I think I was the right person for him to work with at that time. Yeah. So I, I think we just, we just connected. We've always, I think we've always liked each other. And uh, I think we communicate really well, which is important. So, and, and you, know, you know, I'm a huge fan of his and it was just amazing to be able to work with him and see behind the scenes of his career unfolding in such an amazing way. He's, he's an incredibly inspiring human being. He's, I mean, he's actually almost had as much effect on my personal life just uh, in, you know, how to have a, you know, conduct a, my, my business in an you know, honorable way. He's a very inspirational, positive person. And he's, that's been really incredible for me to be around him. I think most people who have had a chance to get to meet him can see that pretty instantly. He's a special guy. Mm -hmm. And when you've done things like the Picasso, the, the super wild stuff for him, it, does he ever come to your shop and stand alongside you and watch the process? <laughs> Um, he, he hasn't been terribly interested. He did come to my shop once, but he hasn't been terribly interested until lately. In the last couple of years, he suddenly realized that somebody makes these things and there's actually a process in making them. And he started asking me all sorts of technical questions for the first time. Originally it would be like the Picasso came out of him saying, how many strings can you put on a guitar or the fretless, um, arch top was, can you make a a guitar that sounds like Charlie Hayden's bass. Uh, that, and that's all the instructions I got on, on those two. And, the, and then he kind of left it up to me and I would send him, I, you know, drawings of the Picasso so that physically, it, you know, it could work. But, uh, but yeah, he's, he's, he's kind of, you know, he, he's doing his thing. I'm doing mine. So. <laughs> and when he asked you, when he asked you how many strings could you put on a guitar, how did you know when you hit your limit? Well, there was more to start with. It was actually the original drawings. There were way more strings and way more necks. Uh, it might have exploded and hurt him. <laughs> so we kind of reeled it in a little bit over time. And then uh, I, I'm not sure. I think it was, you know, multiples of six w was how we came up with 42. Because there's a six string, a 12 string, a 12 string, and a 12 string. So, um, and and also how many machine heads I could fit onto a peg head or onto the side of the guitar kind of, you know, the, the, the math kind of started making decisions. Of course, I, you know, I had no idea when I strung that one up for the first time, I actually was afraid it was going to explode. So I wore safety glasses and I kind of stood back from it as far as I could while I was tuning it up. I was, I wasn't sure it was going to survive the first second, but <laughs> it did. They've all held Turns up. Out I knew what I was, huh? They've all held up. Yeah, the Picasso. His Picasso has held up quite well, actually. He's even dropped it a couple times, and it's been fine. So, <laughs> he I mean, he plays it lighter. 
<laughs> no, uh-uh. I don't think so. I think that one I got just about right. <laughs> you, Instead of a thousand pounds of pressure. Oh my God. You, you've mentioned the drawing process and sort of your thought process on, on how to figure out how many strings go on that, but where are you finding inspiration these days? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, my, honestly, my clients, um, their enthusiasm, um, cause I can kind of go in quite a few different directions. I'm quite versatile as far as what style of guitar I make, but I get excited if they get excited and I, you know, I know I'm making basically a tool for somebody to create more music. So that inspires me. Um, I like looking at what other guitar makers have done, but what I'm kind of been interested in lately is actually I'm quite interested in art and the art, you know, the, the physical way that guitars look, because I, I feel like I've focused on how they sound and how they feel for the most part of my life, but I'm actually really interested in uh, the visual aspect of them. That's, you know, not for all my guitars, but there's some that I'm actually turning into little pieces of art, I think. Um, and, and that probably comes a little bit from having the group of seven guitar project that was actually in an art gallery and treated as pieces of art and viewed by thousands of people in over, you know, one year period. Um, and the focus was on how they looked rather than any other aspect of them. So that that kind of made me realize that's an important part that uh, I actually enjoy because I did go to a couple of art colleges. So that that matters to me. And, and so I'm exploring that a little bit in some of the guitars I'm working on. Yeah, full circle. You, you left uh, yeah. the art school for the woodworking and now you're coming back. Yeah, actually, it's true. It's true. I might even start painting again. Wow. Who knows? I mean, it seems like we all have a lot of spare time right now. <laughs> We all do. Um, do you feel like, uh, obviously, like the Picasso guitar, and you did one that even had more strings, right? Yes. <laughs> Have you pushed, and I'm not just saying like this from a, how many strings can you put on an object perspective, but like, do you feel like you've pushed the engineering side of Luthery as far as you want to push it, or are there other wild creations in your head that you'd love to execute on? There's a couple of really ambitious projects that I'm not sure anybody but me would be interested in um, that are percolating that are technically more difficult than anything I've done yet. Um, But I'm hesitant to start working on anything like that without, um, you know, a client at the end of it uh, who wants it. Um, I, 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 cause it would be sort of close to a guitar, but it might be something else. Um, I mean, I've kind of already pushed the envelope of what a guitar is a little bit, I think, for certainly what I thought a guitar was. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, but I'm also really interested in just making a better six string guitar, just a normal, you know, just strip away all the the visuals and just make a guitar that just sounds as good as it can sound and inspires people. Um, that's, that's really, I, I vacillate between the two worlds. I have to admit. Do you feel like you're still learning what makes a great six string traditional style guitar? Yeah, I do. I feel like, um, I mean, also you're dealing with wood, which is, the, the the x factor of you never really know for sure what the wood's going to do you you can have a pretty good idea um, but you are taking a natural material and trying to make it sing as much as it can and each guitar you have to um, adapt to the materials that are on your bench and assess what you got and what you can do with it so that's that is a challenge with each guitar I think every guitar maker out there um, worth their salt. I'm sure they, you know, everybody is just trying to get better and better. No, but I don't think anybody would say they've got it nailed. I'd be surprised because I don't, I certainly don't feel like I've got it nailed. I'm, I think I'm getting good at what I do after four decades, but I'm, I, I always think I could do better. So my, I'm competing with myself really. When you were describing carving the top, 
what what struck me among other things was you know you're not talking about using one of those duplic carvers or whatever they're called <laughs> you didn't mention cncs at all it sounded very old world have have your tools changed at all much over those four decades um i would say uh well, the, the, i'm using hand planes on the tops and scrapers and yeah the tools have changed a little but i am using really traditional little tiny hand planes that are curved in a certain way. I, I actually had some made that were duplicates of the ones that John D'Angelico and Jimmy DeQuisto used. So I've actually had the hand planes cast specifically for me. As I'm sitting here talking to you on my workbench, I've got about a dozen tiny little hand planes that are that I, I grab depending on what part of the top I'm working on. Um, so yeah, but it, as the, the advantage of that carving at the top by hand and, and I'm not against CNC uh, because I think it's it, there's a lot of time you're just using elbow grease to get close to where you want to get. At the end, I like to, you know, hand carve everything and listen and tap. Um, but on the tops, I like to start right from the raw wood and just work, listen to the wood as I'm carving it and hear what's happening to the top as it's opening up, as I'm revealing the top I want the shapes I want in the solid piece of wood, kind of like what Michelangelo, I think, said about when you're carving uh, a statue, you're just basically removing everything that isn't the statue. Yeah. I think I really phrase that badly, but <laughs> you, I think you get the point. Yeah. When, uh, when you make these really wild creations, I mean, you, you know how to play, but when you made like Picasso, did you even, could you play it? I mean, I know you could strum it, but did you even know what the capabilities of it were? Um, well, I knew whatever I tuned it to, Pat would do something else. So I kind of made it so it could be tuned any way. Uh, I made it kind of Pat proof. Um, but yeah, I played it a little, um, but I was pretty anxious to get it to him. There's one section on the Picasso that is a normal neck that had six strings. Um, even Pat changed that immediately. He put on some insanely fat bass strings. Um, so he just changed everything. It was just a, you know, starting point for him to do what he was going to do. Yeah. yeah. You are at the top of your game. Your guitars command some of the highest prices of any modern guitar. Have there been periods of self-doubt? Have there been any low points that, that you've encountered along the way where you questioned what you're doing? Um, well, I think at the beginning, uh, it was very difficult. So it just so happened that handmade guitars became a, a, a commodity that people would start to pay a lot of money for. But at the very beginning, uh, it was, you know, kind of as Bob Taylor once said that it was like signing an oath of poverty. When when we all started out, we knew that we were doing something we loved, and that has been the one thing that has stayed. I was think it's funny. I was thinking about this yesterday, that if the money all went away, I would still do it um, because I have always loved doing this. I have honestly woken up pretty much every workday of my entire career excited to come in and work. Um, maybe there might've been a couple of days where I had some kind of nightmare scenario I had to fix that. I was like, Ugh. but you know, it's, it's kind of problem solving stuff goes sideways and you have to figure out a way to be positive and find a solution to it. And that I think is actually a good quality that this career has given me is to, if there's a problem, there's a solution and you have to find it. Um, I would say I'm, I'm, I've been, I've had amazing clients. Um, I have made incredible friends in the community. I have wonderful friends and family in my personal life. And I'm very lucky that I get to wake up every day and do something I love. I don't, I don't take it for granted at all. And I'm very, very, very grateful to all the people, the hundreds of people who bought guitars from me over my entire career. Um, I'm, I, and all the opportunities and the stories I've heard from, 
you know, the people I've met is just, it's just amazing. The doors that this career has opened for me into other worlds. I'm, I no, I have no complaints. Do you take apprentices? Uh, I did have a couple, um, but uh, I would say the answer is probably a no. Um, I did. I did have the thing about an apprentice. To be brutally honest, is the moment they're uh, they they're good worth, you know, they're getting gold to you. They want to go out in their own career, and rightfully so, because it really I'm just a stepping stone. So you have to be prepared to spend all this time teaching somebody, and then just as they're just about to get, you know. They're they're good enough that you can have them work on your guitar safely. They want to start their own career, so it's kind of um, I'm not into mass production. I'm I'm only making right now about uh, eight guitars a year, so I'm not sure. I'm, but I'm not going to close my mind to it. If the right person came along, I might have them work side by side with me. And are are all eight eight of those guitars spoken for, or do you build some that it's just I want to build this and see what happens, and I'll sell it when I sell it. Yeah, I always slip in a couple of my own guitars with the wood I've got that I've been saving that I just want to make, or I have an idea and I, I make it. And I'll take that to a guitar show and um, let people look at it. And then, um, I mean, I mean, I made an arch top um, last year called what I call the Americana, and it's a, a non cutaway, and it was kind of my love letter to America because I know you guys are going through a a little bit of a difficult time in the last few years. Um, and I just wanted um, my American friends to know that um, I, for one, appreciate the the heritage of, especially in the guitar world. And so I built it with all American woods that I bought from my American wood dealers. And I, um, I put a lot of, you know, heart and soul into that particular car. And that was one that, you know, I, I just felt like I had to do it because I just wanted to sort of say thank you to um, the guitar community for, um, you know, for the, I don't know, it just, it just felt like the right thing to do. So that has ended up being my personal art shop guitar at, the, at this point in time. I'd love to see that. Yeah, it's just around, it's just actually at the end of my bench here. Your career has had such a, interesting trajectory um looking back would you have changed anything um no i don't think so i think all the ups and downs are part of the journey um no i don't think so i i maybe if i had been physically a little stronger that would have helped <laughs> that's about the only thing um no i'm i I can't, I can't complain about anything. Nice. Yeah. Sorry. No, this was great. I can't. You're, you're acing this test. Am I? Good. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Phew. It's the first test I've had in a while. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Jason. (laughs) Describe your, uh, your shop for me. Like if, how would you describe it if I came in and was blind or something? If you were blind and you opened your eyes and saw it, because if you're blind, you'd be smelling uh, sawdust and you'd be tripping on stuff. Um, okay. So we don't want that. Um, I, I have two shops because I actually have two places I kind of live. One is in downtown Toronto and it's in my house and it's a shop I've been in for years and years. But I've also recently uh, in the last decade moved to a, a small town called Almont, Ontario, and I have a house here as well. Um, and so at the bottom of my garden, um, there's a river uh, just on the other side of a hill. And I have a coach house there, which I've converted into a shop. So there used to be a couple of horses in here with um, a carriage, I guess. And uh, it's a brick building with a tin roof. And um, there's a climate controlled room that is facing out to the west. So I can see over farmer's fields and I can see a waterfall from my uh, window and I have to walk down a hill to get here. And um, it's quite a nice space. I have an upstairs where I store all my wood and um, I've got a couple of workbenches that look out on greenery and I've got, uh, it's about a 15 foot, my main room is about 15 foot square 
with windows all, all the way around. And the workbenches are all built custom made so that they are the exact height I want them to be. And I've got kind of a master bench that I have all sorts of, uh, all my tools are within, the, my main tools are all hung up so that I can grab them quickly. And I've got a, a kind of a crappy stereo system because they all die from the dust. But I, <laughs> uh, um, and lots of masks so I can, uh, you know, and lamps and it's quite cozy and, and, um, and then in the other room, I've got all the main kind of noisy tools, like the routers and the bandsaws and the joiners. And then um, there's a, at the other end, there's uh, thickness sanders and polishers, do you polishing s- machine. Do guitars still sometimes get built in the city as well? Yep. Yeah, I go back and forth. I will be making uh, the guitars that I have here, all these arch tops, I will be putting the purfling on them in Toronto in, in the next uh, couple of weeks. That seems, uh, it's awesome, but it also seems a little daunting having to move these parts back and forth. Have you, you've got a system clearly. I do. I've actually been commuting for 15 years, so I'm, I've actually got it right down. I've got like kind of a, uh, a, a, a box of tools I take back and forth between the two places. And I've got duplicate tools at both places. So, uh, I just go back and forth and back and forth. Is there a, yeah. is there one shop where, certain tasks you like to do certain tasks versus the other, or are they kind of interchangeable in your head? Um, I can do everything in both shops, but uh, right now I'm sort of preferring the Almont shop because it's kind of beautiful here. It's uh, Almont itself is the birthplace of the inventor of basketball. I'm going to throw that in. Uh, it's a quaint little town with a river running through it. A lot of old mills. It's very pretty. This is very nice, tight, friendly community um of a lot of artists um and just really cool people here so there you can walk into town and you go to baker bob's and you get a coffee and a homemade bagel and you walk across the little bridge the footbridge on on the river and you can see otters and beaver in the river it's it's quite lovely i can't do that in toronto so (laughs) but um, but Toronto's got its urban attraction to me. I'm, I'm kind of torn between the two worlds, for sure. But uh, wherever I am, I'm happy, so uh, I can't go wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's a good problem to have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Linda, thank you. <laughs> I did it. We did it. All right. That was my talk with the one and only Linda Manzer. I'm Jason. Our music is by Paul Rigby. Special thanks on graphics, production, and inspiration to Peter Hilgendorf. Keep the comments coming, and if you like the podcast, leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts.